Hey, welcome everybody and, and thanks so much for joining in. Uh, we'll give it a few minutes for uh, more people to join in here. Um, you know, can't ask for a better Thursday night uh, crew than what we have here uh, with Major Katie uh, Neumeyer and uh, Captain Ezra Yu, as well as myself. Um, we will be speaking a little bit more in detail, but we'll just give it a cute few minutes for everybody to uh, pile in. Um, I did want to just draw everybody's attention to the chat. It's awesome for if you could just drop where you're joining from tonight, who you are. Um, we'd love to make this as interactive as possible for us to learn about you, for you to learn about each other. Um, so if you have a second, just go ahead and drop that in the webinar chat where you're joining in from tonight. Um, and we will get started in a couple of seconds here. It looks like we have a couple people from DC, Utah, New Jersey, Texas. Uh, we got people from all over, which is, which is fantastic. Um, we'll give it about another minute or two for people to to log in and then we will get going in the meantime, I will start sharing my screen, so you guys all are on the same page here. San Diego, Alabama, North Carolina, Florida wow we really have people from from everywhere tonight. That is great. All right, well, why don't we go ahead and get started here. Um, first, I'll, I'll introduce myself. Um, I'm Dr. Sahel Mehta. I'm a interventional radiologist in the Boston area. I'm also the founder of Med School Coach. Uh, I've been doing this for a long time. And what is this? This is helping students get into and through medical school. It's sort of um, a passion of mine. It is something that um, we at Med School Coach take really seriously. And we are super excited today to host this webinar with the US Army. Um, and specifically, um, Major Katie uh, Neumeyer, as well as Captain Ezra Yu, um, both physicians themselves. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves in a second here. But it's really an, it's really an amazing webinar because it's going to allow you guys to hopefully get an opportunity to understand, A, um, how to get into med school, B, the pathway that Major Katie and Captain Ezra have taken through their own training, through their own life as um, both medical students now uh, been into residency and attending life and beyond, um, and how to potentially give back to your own country, how to do something maybe even slightly selfish for yourself, which is attend medical school for free and come out uh, debt free. And, and there's no doubt about it that that is a super important uh, topic, particularly today. Um, maybe I'll just take a second and uh, let Major Katie and Captain Ezra just introduce themselves and say hello before we move on. Perfect. Thank you so much for having us. We're really grateful for this opportunity to work with you guys and share a little bit about how the Army can help people on their journey to becoming physicians. Um, I'm Major Katie Neumeyer. Uh, I'm a pediatric intensivist in the Army and really excited to share my story with everyone tonight. Hey guys, I'm Captain Ezra Yu. I'm an internal medicine resident in the Army. Uh, so technically physician myself, but just starting my residency training. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited and grateful to be here too. Thanks so much, Dr. Yu and Dr. Yu uh, Neumeyer. We, we can't thank you enough for um, sharing your journey uh, with everybody tonight. Um, you know, a couple of quick things as you guys are out there. Um, a couple of reminders. One, the webinar is typically recorded. We'll send out a recording so um, that way you guys can have this after. All the important tidbits that will be dropped will be shared. Um, check your chat as you go through for really important uh, links. We'll be dropping important links throughout the um, conversation here tonight, and it's a great place to find them. Um, ask questions anytime. We really want to make this interactive, and at the end, we will have a Q&A session. Um, so you can feel Feel free to ask questions. If you're going to ask a question, just so you guys know, the best place to do that is the little Q&A button um, rather than the chat, because sometimes they can get lost in the chat. But either way, we'll, we'll find them and we'll get to them. Um, and, you know, a couple other things. We're not going to cover every single detail um, today. 
there's a lot in your journey. Um, I would love actually in the chat, if you guys could drop, you dropped where you're from, but it would also be great to drop a little bit, but maybe where you are in your journey. Are you a pre-med student? Are you a high school student, freshman, sophomore? Have you taken the MCAT? Those kind of things help us also tailor um, a little bit of the presentation as well. You know, we can't cover everything on this presentation from MCAT studying to getting into medical school to how to pay for it and how to get an Army scholarship, but we'll try to cover as much as we can. And um, we would be happy to ask, um, answer any questions that we don't get to after as well. And, you know, we're here for you, right? So at, both at Med School Coach as well as um, Captain Yu and Major Newmeyer, I mean, we're, we're all sort of here to share our journey, here to help you guys as you guys are seniors in college and, you know, fourth years and juniors and all these kind of things we were in your shoes once and we love to talk about this this is um, a lot of what we do in our professional lives along with taking care of patients and so we're here for you ask away um, during the course of the conversation um, you know i'll set the stage just very briefly right um, and maybe this is all that needs to be said um, which is that medical school is expensive and medical school and medical school graduates unfortunately have a lot of debt these days right we all many of you guys are out there in undergrad um, doing post back programs i see as well for some of you guys and we know that that's an expensive proposition and then medical school on top of that also an expensive proposition right um, almost 80 percent of students plus are going to graduate with some sort of debt and you know it, it does make an impact on your career choice it makes an impact on your future life it makes an impact on sort of um you know where you could live uh, <coughs> excuse me i'm getting over <coughs> um major new matter will appreciate that I'm getting over a bunch of rsv that's going around in the pediatric population excuse me one sec <coughs> um so you know medical school debt is certainly um, something that's going to affect all of us and is a is a true um, it, it's just a reality. <coughs> and so to potentially be able to get through medical school without taking on any debt is just obviously it's really freeing and liberating in a lot of ways. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually turn it over to Major Newmeyer right now. Um, she's going to go through a little bit of, you know, how to maybe get through this process without uh, without paying, uh, without going into debt. It'll also allow me to rest my voice, which obviously I need right now. So maybe I'll turn it over. <coughs> and just again, as, you, as we go through, feel free to um, drop questions in the chat. We're here for you. We'll answer them as we go. Perfect. All right. Let me just make sure the slides are coming through. Okay. Are they showing up? Perfect. Okay. I'd like to have two tabs going. Um, I'm, I'm Zoom naive, uh, so bear with me if I have any technical difficulties. Um, but we've already given a brief intro to ourselves, uh, so I want to jump into it. And what we're going to talk about tonight is more specifics of my story uh, and Ezra's story and really hit a broad overview of HPSP and then the common questions of if you were to go through HPSP, what is life like as an Army medical student, resident, and then beyond residency? So I've already told you guys who I am, but I'm Katie Newmeyer. I'm originally from a suburb of Denver, Colorado, and I went to a really small school in Northern, uh, Northern Illinois for my undergrad. And why on earth did I go there? Um, a few reasons. The first is that I got to play soccer simultaneously while presuming, uh, assuming my pre-med studies. Um, but the big thing for me is that my family didn't have the ability to support me financially for school. So I really only applied places where I knew I was going to have great financial aid to help me on my journey that I knew I wanted to become a physician and pre-med was going to be my focus. So I graduated there in 2009, which I think most people that are on this webinar are probably too young to know, but that was a really economically challenging time. And I had my letter of acceptance to med school in hand, and I started to be really worried of like, does the cost of medical, is the cost of medical school going to prohibit me from pursuing my dream? So I started to pursue uh, options for scholarships, um, but as you know, they're really pretty few and far between for med school. So one of the first things I came across was the Tri-Service Health Profession Scholarship Program. And I initially had no interest. I knew nothing about the military. Uh, I, my younger brother had enlisted, but I didn't really have any other understanding or affiliation with it. And the idea of being in the military seemed so mutually exclusive from being a physician that I, I wasn't initially interested. 
But the more I learned about the scholarship and a lot of the benefits, I decided that it was something that fit me and it fit my values. And while I hadn't considered serving my country, I could do that and still graduate med school debt free. It seemed like a really great opportunity. So I utilized the scholarship to go to Rocky Vista University. It's an osteopathic school in Colorado. Uh, I really wanted to be back in Colorado near my family during the intense four years that would be med school. But also, I only applied to DO schools. Um, if there's questions about that, I'm happy to answer those. But my doc my whole life had been a DO, so I was very familiar with it and interested in pursuing that. I knew pretty early in med school that I wanted to do pediatrics. I love taking care of kids. I think they're a fun, uh, vulnerable population. Uh, so I attended my pediatric residency through the Army at Madigan Army Medical Center in Tacoma, Washington. It's about an hour south of Seattle. That picture to the right is uh, my three female co-residents on our graduation day. Uh, we, <laughs> we rarely wore our dress uniforms during residency, so we were all excited to be in them and take a photo together. And then for me, my residency is when I realized kind of two things. The first is that I actually really liked being in the Army. I didn't know a ton about it at first, but the more I was around the culture, it really fit me and I enjoyed it. And that Army medicine had some definite advantages. So while I originally thought I was just doing my residency and then the four years I owed the Army for my scholarship and move on to civilian medicine, I started to think that maybe that wasn't the case and that I was going to make the Army a longer term option, which worked out because also during residency, I realized that I didn't I didn't love Gen Peds. Um, but I really found myself being drawn to inpatient rotations, um, being around sicker kids. Um, there's two things to that. The first is that they're a captive audience. You get to see your interventions and whether they're making a difference or not, so you can adjust them. And then the second piece is that the ICU had the added benefit of getting to do some hands-on procedures, which I really loved. So I decided to pursue a PEDS uh, critical care fellowship which everyone is surprised when I tell them I'm a pediatrician in the army, um, let alone that they have pediatric subspecialists, but they do because people like me in the army have kids who unfortunately get sick and need someone to take care of them. So the army for fellowships has some fellowship programs in army hospitals, but not everything. So then they uh, gave me the ability to attend a civilian fellowship of my choosing. And so I went to primary children's through the University of Utah in Salt Lake City, mostly because I really wanted to be very well versed in managing pediatric trauma and they had a great trauma program. So I was there for three years, basically living like a civilian, getting paid by the Army and got really great training. Uh, the picture there is my four co-fellows on our graduation day with the beautiful Utah mountains in the background. After fellowship, my first assignment as an attending was uh, at Brooke Army Medical Center in San Antonio, Texas. A lot of people have heard of it, even if they know nothing about the Army, because it's pretty famous. There's some awesome things that happen there. I was the chief of the sedation unit and then eventually the chief of the PICU and was faculty within their PEDS residency program and really loved my time there. It's a great city. If anyone ever ends up getting to train in San Antonio, I highly recommend it. Um, and I miss it. Um, right now, I'm actually at Fort Knox, Kentucky. It's about an hour south of Louisville. And I'm in this very unique role where, yes, I still get to do PICU, but I'm the one embedded physician with medical recruiting that helps answer questions like we're hopefully going to cover tonight. And that the recruiters know a lot about the paperwork and the process to apply for the scholarship, but they maybe don't know the specifics about going through the Army match or what is a day in the life as a physician like in the Army? How is that different than the civilian? How is it not different? Um, and so hopefully we can get into some of those tonight. But before we jump into that, I want to turn it over to uh, Captain Yu since he's an intern who's living through that training right now and he can share his story with you as well. Thanks, Major Neumeyer. Um, and since you already slides up, I'll just go off of that um, and not have to rent the field. So uh, I'll unless you know when to uh, you know advance. But yeah, guys, I'm Captain Yu uh, or, or Dr. Yu, um, intern at William Beaumont Army Medical Center as an internal medicine resident. Um, I got my bachelor's degree at the University of Southern California, got a great education and training out there in Los Angeles, uh, did a post back on a couple of years of working in between. Um, ended up matriculating into the A.T. Still University uh, School of Osteopathic Medicine in Arizona. And a lot like, like Major Neumeyer, I think for me, lots of decisions were financially driven. Um, and there definitely was a, a desire to serve as well. Uh, my family and I had moved here when I was about three from the Philippines and obviously had lots of great opportunities uh, and chances to pursue a better life here in the States. And this was my way to give back. So around the same, same time I got into medical school, uh, looked at ways to pay for it, and really the Army was a great way to uh, give back to the states um, and this country, and also a way to really just uh, pursue a financially viable option for medical school. So I uh, started there in 2019, graduated about uh, in 2023, 
uh, and started my residency. And so to go on to the next slide, that's uh, the next part of my story. Um, I'm currently an internal medicine resident at William Beaumont Army Medical Center uh, in Fort Bliss, El Paso, Texas. Uh, got the uh, hospital logo to the left and the home unit here is the first armor division. Uh, for lots of you who have taken chemistry, it reminds me a lot like one of those MSDS <laughs> safety data sheets that we fill out because of the color and the, and that, but that is the uh, logo for the division. Uh, below is a photo of the hospital, and to the right is a picture of me and some of my co-residents. So uh, I'm very early into my career, but I've had fun, no regrets along the way. Uh, been around some really great people uh, and some faculty. And uh, slide. Uh, my life in the Army, um, it's been about four years so far, but I've made some great friends. Uh, you really join an awesome family, too. Um, I think we're just all united by a common vision and purpose. Um, you get into shape, you know, for, for the trainings that you do. Uh, you get to do some cool uh, field exercises. Down here below is a picture of us at Camp Bullis, uh, where we practice area vac. Uh, made some friends across different branches. Uh, two as well. And so for me, um, not only like really, what started out really as a, I think, an economic decision um, really became uh, just this awesome culture and family that I joined. And so uh, to kind of reiterate what I said before, no regrets at all uh, about this program. Great. Uh, thanks, Ezra. I'm sure we'll have uh, more questions that come up uh, for somebody that's closer to the residency process than I am now that I'm further out. So um, hopefully we can get to those. But I wanted to quickly cover just in general how your options to potentially become a physician in the Army. And tonight we're predominantly focusing on the focusing on the Health Profession Scholarship Program, or you'll hear to us refer to it as HPSP. But there's another option, and that's the Uniformed Services University of Health Sciences, or you'll hear it called USIS. Um, that's the military medical school. You can kind of think of it as like attending the academy where, uh, for undergrad, whereas HPSP is kind of similar to ROTC, but for med school, they're a little different, but just general concepts. And your tuition is paid in full there. You get an active duty salary while you're there, which is higher than the monthly stipend with HPSP. Um, and because of that, there's a little bit longer commitment post-residency. Uh, so that's seven years. And you do apply to that differently. So you apply to that through the standard med school AMCAS application, which we'll talk more specifics about how to apply for HPSB. But I just wanted to be um, totally inclusive here that that's another option and definitely something worth pursuing. And I believe there is already a med school coach webinar out there on uses that has a ton of information. So you should definitely check that out if it is a, another option for you. But tonight, like I said, we're talking more about HPSP. So what does that cover? What does that encompass? So it's your full tuition uh, for medical school, whether you go to the least uh, expensive medical school or the most, as long as it's a U.S. accredited medical school. They will also reimburse you for any of your mandatory books and supplies. I remember that being a really hefty cost up front, and so it was nice to get that reimbursed and get that money uh, back later in the process. And then you also get a monthly stipend. Um, on the previous slide, it was referenced at $2,700. The more specific amount is uh, $2,728. Uh, it goes up every July. So if you research uh, HPSP and different programs, you'll see that maybe that number is a little bit different. That's just because it increases annually. And then there's also currently a $20,000 accession bonus. So after you start school, that uh, nice influx of cash is helpful. For me, I didn't own a car in undergrad, so I used that to help buy my first car. So I had something reliable to get around for med school. And then I think some Something that goes totally unappreciated because we always talk about the financial aspects of the scholarship is you have access to the Army's residency programs, which are really, really great programs. We're going to talk more about that later, um, but that's almost a bigger selling point to me than anything else is the faculty in these programs really care about their individual students um, and their success. And so it's a, it's a huge advantage to being in the Army is being access to the Army match. So that's great. The Army covers all of that, but what do you have to do in exchange? Um, and that's four years of service as an Army physician or the length of your residency if it's longer than four years. And I think everybody here tonight is predominantly pre-med, but I just included the caveat here that the Army has scholarships for other health professions as well. If, if you or anybody else you're aware of is interested and you could refer them that way. So often when I talk to students, uh, pre-med students that are applying to med school and they're considering the scholarship, they have categories of questions of like, okay, all I've wanted to do is get into medical school. What's this scholarship going to do? Is this going to interfere with my ability to succeed academically as a student? 
Then the next big set of questions is related to residency. Like, okay, you've got accepted. The next target on the wall is residency. That's that's the final step in your journey to becoming a physician. And you want to make sure that you can go to a great residency. And then what is life like after residency in the Army? And so those are kind of general categories of things we wanted to cover tonight. So hopefully that will answer some of the questions that I've already seen come through in the chat. Thank you guys for being so interactive. Hopefully we can get to all of them. And if um, not, we'll have our contact information at the end and you can reach out to myself or Ezra at any time. Time. But the first category of things is life as a medical student. Um, and really what I can tell you is that in general, day to day, week to week, even month to month, no one would even know you were in the army unless you told them. You don't have to wear a uniform to school. You don't have to do any online or weekend trainings. Your job truly for the army at that time is just to go to school, get good grades and make good choices, just like your civilian peers. Uh, so the status while you're in medical school is this inactive reserve status. So to maintain that, there is an annual requirement. And we don't need to get into the granularity of that tonight, but I did include this because it is a question I always get. Um, if you're reading about HPSP online, you'll see something referred to as ADTs or active duty trainings, and that's what meets that annual requirement. There's one per fiscal year. In your first year of medical school, this is usually fulfilled by going to your initial officer training, most typically between your first and second year of medical school. Sometimes there's other time frames for that to work out, but that's the most typical. The big piece of information here, and I saw this question come through in the chat, is this is not boot camp like you see in the movies. I am not tough enough to handle that. It is really much more of an uh, officer and leader course of be becoming a medical corps officer, which means physician in the army, you are automatically a leader. So you have to be able to talk the talk and walk the walk. So they really teach you the basics of the Army, um, and there's some great leadership and embedded medical training in that as well. And then in your second, third, and fourth years of medical school, that requirement varies, um, but the biggest advantage to you is usually in your third and fourth year, you use that time to go do sub-internships, audition, or interview rotations, depending where you go to school. Everybody calls them something different, um, but you use that time to go to an Army hospital that has the residencies you're interested in and show off your skill set to that program there. Uh, so that's really life as a student. I don't know if there's any questions related to that that want to inject before we jump into residency. Um, but if not, we can keep flowing because I think it'll kind of give you an overview and then we can get to questions at the end. Um, but transitioning into the life as an Army resident, and we have one here with us, so he can probably speak to it better than me if there are specific questions that come up. But the point of this slide is to not for you to read the names of the Army hospitals, but just to get an idea that the Army does GME or graduate medical education really well. We have a lot of programs, internship programs, residency and fellowship, um, and they're really high quality. The Army is very vested in the success of their medical trainees. Um, and this is just to speak to that, that we have a large volume of them. And I also saw this question in the chat already come up of, does the Army influence your choice of specialty and your ability to apply for residency? And the answer is no. I think that's a common uh, misperception is that because the Army, with you think you need all emergency medicine docs and trauma surgeons that they don't also have pediatricians or dermatologists, um, but people in the Army and their families need access to all varieties of physicians. And so your choice of residency is not influenced by the Army and they really have the full scope available to you. And this map just highlights our main uh, training locations. The ones in that kind of orange yellow are true army hospitals where the others uh, the, in gray are joint. So the one in San Antonio is a joint Air Force institution. So there's Army residents and Air Force residents. And then the one in DC, there's Army and Navy students. Uh, so they could go to Hawaii if you want to go to for residency. A lot of locations in Texas and then some on the, in the Southeast as well. And so this, again, is just to highlight where they're at. If there's specific questions, we can address those later. And then this slide is not necessarily life as a resident, but life as a fellow, potentially. Another thing that people misunderstand is that you still have access to applying to fellowship uh, and there's ability to subspecialize in really pretty much anything you're interested in. So that's why the text is so small, not necessarily to be able to read all of them, but to get the concept that the Army has a lot of subspecialty options available to you and you can pursue fellowship at any of these. Some of these are within Army hospitals and some of them like myself are within civilian institutions and it varies a little bit. You're Year to year what is needed, but there's a lot of available options. And we can talk more about residency if there's specific questions, but we wanted to make sure there was enough time at the end to address those. So quickly just summarizing what is life like as an Army attending? So you get through residency, what does that four years you owe the Army look like? Um, you'd be practicing in an Army hospital or clinic. That's a little bit depending on what your specialty is. I saw a few questions come through about pay as well. So you do get your officer pay. 
which is based on how long you've been in the army and your rank, which both of those things go up over time. So that pay goes up over time. You get your housing allowance, an allowance for food. If you look it up, you'd be referred to as BAS. And then you also get your medical specialty pay because you've trained to have this specific skill set that is beneficial to the army. So you get compensated for that with medical specialty pay. And then some of the things that I think really often go untalked about. Um, as a physician, everyone is interested in maintaining some sort of uh, proximity to academics and teaching. Uh, and I, that's my favorite part of the Army is I still get to teach medical students and residents in my job. Uh, they're eager to learn and they, they keep uh, my fuel up to keep my skills up. So that's, that's, that's a huge advantage. Additionally, the research opportunities. So I am not very into research, uh, but I know lots of people that have used the Army to really fund all of their research projects and get a lot of publications out of it. And that could be something as small as a more clinical retrospective project to bench research because you have access to government grants and there's really endless opportunities to participate in that. And then another, my second favorite part is the leadership position. So I mentioned I was the chief of the PICU and that was in my second year out of fellowship, which in the civilian world, that would take a long time to reach that. And so I really like taking on those additional leadership roles and the army does a great job of embedding some specific training along the way to make you successful at that. And the leadership positions can really take on any flavor, whether that's clinical leadership, um, GME leadership, uh, or a more operational army leadership focus it really just can be tailored based on your interests. Um, and that kind of leads into life in the army. So that's a lot about being a doctor in the army and that my day to day as a peds intensivist looks a lot like it did when I was a civilian fellow doing pediatric critical care. But what about when I'm not working? I get a lot of questions about this as well, uh, especially as a, as a woman in the army. Are you able to have a family? Are you able to have kids? Or will you get kicked out of the army if, you, if that's the case? And that, that couldn't be <laughs> further from the truth. So I'm married and I have two kids. I've had both my kids post residency and fellowship training within the army and I've had great um, uh, parental leave benefits um, that I've, I've enjoyed growing my family in the army. And then the second question I get asked a lot is about travel. So I'm from Colorado, so I love to ski and hike and I clearly can't ski in Kentucky. Uh, so I do travel back to Colorado usually twice a year to ski and we travel to other places as well because we like to get out and do things. So your ability to travel is not limited. You get three days of vacation a year and that accumulates fast. Um, and so you're still able to go and do fun things. And then the picture on the right is more highlighting some of those opportunities I already touched on. So in this role I'm in right now where I'm super passionate about helping pre-med students um, not just get into medical school, but also how to fund their journey. Uh, I get to go to a bunch of national conferences. Uh, and then we also attend a lot of middle school and high school STEM events to increase awareness for students, not just about the Army, but hey, you maybe never thought of this just based on where you lived or what your family's done, but medicine is a real option for you. And so getting to have a really wide sphere of influence um, and mentor young people on their journey becoming physicians. Uh, I'm happy to be here tonight to answer any of those questions. Uh, so before we turn it over for that, I'm going to leave this screen up because it has our QR code. We do have an Army Medicine Careers app that you can download and it goes through all of our different specialties and where the locations they have it. But the more important part of it is it shows you potentially how to apply. Um, and that's done through an AMED or Army Medical Department recruiter. We have a few of them on here tonight that are hopefully answering some of the questions in the chat as we talk. Um, but this, the app will help connect you directly to where they're located because they are different than a regular Army recruiter. It definitely needs to be a medical recruiter. Um, and that can help you get in touch with them or I can help you as well. And then the question I often get related to this is also when to apply. And it's most typically done while you're concurrently applying to med school. So submit your primary applications when you're filling out your secondaries. You can apply for the scholarship because you can apply even before you have a letter of acceptance. You just can't fully be rewarded the scholarship clearly until you're accepted into medical school, which hopefully with some of med school coaches assistance that you can achieve that goal. Uh, I'm going to share our contact information here as well, because there's a separate QR code here that you guys can see in. Um, we can hopefully turn it over for you guys for some questions. That was um, super helpful and super insightful, uh, doctors. I, I, I definitely um, saw a lot of questions come through and maybe just to back it up a little bit um, and make sure that the students understand this is a scholarship that you apply for while applying to medical school, as you just said. Are there minimum requirements um, or is there is there sort of 
a a large pool of people who are applying or is this something where you feel like hey if this is something you're interested in um and you can get into medical school you can take advantage of this great question and thank you for uh, bringing that up so there are minimum requirements however the army is really trying to look at applicants holistically so maybe if you don't have the mcat score that is the exact cutoff for the gpa those things can be considered in a waiver process so you are still eligible for the scholarship if you don't necessarily meet those criteria um, which i don't even necessarily want to share because i don't want to discourage anybody from pursuing it because we're really considering everybody right now because we understand that everybody comes from different backgrounds so there are but the best way to figure out whether you meet those or not is meeting with a, a medical recruiter. And, and maybe to interject a, a couple other questions that people certainly seem to be having here. Um, is the, is the, do other branches of the, of the government sort of have similar programs um, or is this an army specific program? This is, HPSP is a tri-service program, so the Air Force and the Navy offer it as well. Um, and really, the financial benefits are identical. Uh, and in general, the programs are really more similar than they are different. And when people ask me why one service to the other, I say it's usually based on your personal preference um, and where, where you're interested in potentially being located or if you have family bias that's pushing you in one direction or the other. But I encourage everyone to look, in, look into all three of them and make the most informed decision if they are going to make a decision to join the military. Another question we've got a few times is, could you talk a little about the transition to civilian life after you've met the four-year requirement from the Army? Yeah, uh, that's a good one. And I often get it and I forget to address it. So I myself haven't had to go through that yet since I've chosen to stay in the Army. But I don't have exact numbers, but I'd say it's probably pretty split um, after their initial commitment, whether people choose to stay or move on. A lot of my friends have chosen to move on and they have had no issues transitioning to civilian medicine because it's a hundred percent fully translatable skill set. And then add being a veteran and your military experience on your CV, which demonstrates your discipline, demonstrates you have great leadership skills, demonstrates that you've had great residency training. It's easy. It's definitely easy to find a job. I think one of the things that um, maybe a lot of the students out there who are pre-meds perhaps don't appreciate is getting into medical school is really hard. Um, I think everybody appreciates that. But then there's the next steps, uh, which you talked a little bit about, which is getting into a residency, right? And, you know, if you're a U.S. medical graduate, you're almost definitely going to get into a residency. But sometimes some of the specialized residencies or the more competitive residencies are actually really, really tough to get into, um, maybe even tougher to get into the medical school. And so if you're out there um, looking to apply to a super specialized residency, um, this may actually be a great route. Um, Dr. Yu and Dr. Neumeyer are, are uh, you know, in more primary care type residencies, which is also a great route for it. But if I, you know, maybe you guys can talk a little bit about and hit on a little bit more about that residency aspect, because I think some of the army residency programs, let's say in orthopedics, um, a super competitive specialty would be really tough for in to get into in general. Um, and not to say it's easy, you have to, you have to do fantastic, I'm sure in medical school to still get into the army um, residencies, but it provides probably a set number of spots that are open. Yeah, I can answer generally, and then I can turn it over to uh, Captain Yu since he's just recently went through that, so he can speak to it better than me. Uh, but in general, the Army uh, residency match rates uh, are pretty similar in term to terms of per specialty to the civilian world, and that it's proportionally competitive. So Army residencies are only for Army students, so we don't need a certain number of orthopedic surgeons per year, we need less than that. And so sometimes those smaller numbers are intimidating, but you have to remember there's proportionally less applicants. And so for the most part, something that's very competitive like orthopedics is also still pretty competitive in the army, whereas something like pediatrics and internal medicine, um, there may be extra spots every year. Um, I think the key part on the army that, it, that results in our high match rates is that the whole process is a little smaller scale. So it's easier to navigate. And so on those audition rotations, you can 
really stand out as an individual with your performance. And that can really be incorporated into your acceptance there because um, they get to know you as you and not just a, a metric applying to their program. So I think uh, the more the personable part of the process um, results in the increased and the higher match rates. Captain Yu, I don't know if you have anything you want to add that's more general. Um, yeah, I think speaking to that too, uh, you're really looking at about seven, eight different uh, residency hospitals around the Army, at least. I think the maybe speaking to some of those other branches, I know the Air Force and Navy has some other different hospitals. But uh, when thinking about, you know, where to set up your ADTs, the amount of interviews to set up, uh, you really are able to kind of focus your efforts into a smaller pool. And so yeah, I think if you crunch down the numbers, you know, mathematically, how much more competitive is it than or less competitive is in, in the civilian world? I don't know if that is much more or less, but as far as paying and, and setting up these auditions, um, you get one, I think, paid for each year, and then uh, you are having to fly or travel to as many different places. So I got to like visit three different um, hospitals during my um, ADT and do auditions with pretty much all seven programs. And so um, for me, it was a big relief to know that like I could focus my efforts uh, towards the narrower pool. And like um, Major Numeria said, uh, I think personality and work ethic really have an opportunity to sign because, uh, you know, you want to have your basic competency, do well on your boards. But I think more than that, they are looking for someone who, you know, can work well with, you know, their co-residents the next three or five years. Someone you're going to be able to do overnight call with, someone that uh, you, the staff and ER consult with. So um, there's... There's a lot they look at it, and holistic is it, it, that's a really great word, uh, ma'am, because I think that's something that's really emphasized um, in, in the army. There are additional questions out here um, regarding maybe the commitment post, um, which I, I believe you said was four years or up to the amount of time that a residency might be. Um, can you just touch on that again as we've had a couple questions on that one? I don't know if you wanna address that, Captain, you or I can since you're in the midst of it still, but yeah, so since the, the four-year scholarship, the Army's paying for four years of school. So if you did anything that's a three-year residency, so PEDS, family med, internal med, you would owe four years after residency. The commitment starts once your residency training is done. However, if you decided that you wanted to be a neurosurgeon um, and something like a seven-year re re residency, then that would be the length of your commitment just since you were still getting training during that time. Um, and that's, it's, not, it's not cumulative. It's just seven instead of the four because you received that prolonged training. And I'm uh, gonna add to that. Go ahead. Um, if one were to do a fellowship like uh, Major Neumeyer, that would be additional time uh, added to service as well. Yeah, and I think there were, there are still a couple of questions about applying, um, and maybe just some clarity around any MD or DO program, you would be eligible for this scholarship. You would be applying normally to as many medical schools as you would like while also applying for the scholarship. Maybe uh, Major Neumeyer, if you could just go over that a little, there seems to be a ton of questions about that. Perfect, thank you. There's so many questions I like can't keep up with <laughs> scrolling over to them. So I appreciate you consolidating them. So yeah, the process of applying for the scholarship is typically done side by side when you're applying to med school. So you're filling out your med school applications and then you would meet with an army medical recruiter and they would help you apply for the scholarship. So they have all the documents that you need to get together to apply, compile them. It would go before what we call a board where they select people for the scholarship. And then you would ultimately find out whether you received a scholarship. And depending on when you are applying, um, would kind of depend on when it was awarded. Like right now, I've been talking to some medical students that are starting to receive their letters of acceptance already. Uh, we reset our scholarships on the fiscal year. So they just reset in October. So we're awarding our, our first scholarships because they're just being selected. Um, but the scholarships can be given all through the winter and spring and even up until when school starts. 
So even if you don't apply simultaneously and you already have your letter of acceptance and then you start to hear from the financial aid office and panic about the costs that they're sharing with you, you can now start the process to apply for a scholarship. So it's typically done side by side, but doesn't necessarily have to be that. And, and I'll take that opportunity as a little plug for those of you who are applying um, or, you know, considering applying in the next year, two years, three years, however long it might be. You know, what we do at Med School Coach is we try to help you get in, right? So we're working with you as an applicant, really making sure that you're crafting the right essays, applying to the right schools, targeting the right areas, presenting yourself as an applicant that is hopefully going to get in. And we do that really well. You know, we've been doing it for 15 plus years. We work with thousands of students a year and they always get a, I would say a double the chances of acceptance as a normal student going through. Um, just because what we do is we hook you up with physicians on our end who have sat on admissions committees, who know what these schools are looking for, who know how to help you portray your application in a way that makes you stand out, right? The average acceptance to a US school is probably around 40, 50% at this point um, of applicants. And our sort of acceptance is more around the 90% range. So we can't get everybody in, but we can get a lot of students in. And what's cool about, um, you know, a, a program like the HSSP is that if you get in, you're probably a really well qualified candidate for the program. And so that means that you can essentially go to medical school for free, right, and actually be paid to go to medical school. So if you're somebody who's out there who's saying, well, you know, I would go to medical school, but I'm worried about the cost. Well, I think, you know, hanging and uh, hanging your shingle and saying, hey, I'm going to hire a med school coach to help me get in and at the same time help me apply or simultaneously apply to an army, you know, scholarship program. And now your entire tuition is taken care of. I mean, that's really powerful, right? Um, the small investment that you probably make into the help to get you into school will go a very long way because you will literally have been able to pay for all of medical school. If you don't get in, the scholarship unfortunately is not worth anything. You can't use the scholarship unless you unless you actually get into school. And so we have a lot of students every single year who will do this um, and be hooked up with a physician and say, hey, I'm gonna take um, and utilize the services to get me in because I know at the other end, there's a scholarship waiting for me that will allow me to go through medical school, get paid, find a specialty later on that I like, and honestly, have a lot of benefits well beyond, right? I, I've, I've harped on maybe a few times the the payment aspect, which is huge, right? I mean, graduating with 250K versus debt versus graduating with $0 worth of debt is a very, 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 very different story, let me tell you. But at the same time, you know, there's, as, as Major Neumeier has sort of said multiple times here, there are so many benefits to coming out as an army physician, right? The leadership opportunities, just the, you know, uh, perhaps this is the wrong word, but the street cred of being, you know, an army physician is, is tremendous. You know, imagine having major or captain in front of your name, along with doctor, you are now in a whole different category. Um, even if you end up going applying for civilian jobs later on, or, you know, coming back into civilian hospitals, it's just a very different, um, it's a very different world that you will now be in. And so it's a, you know, it's a great opportunity, I think, for a lot of students out there to potentially take um, if you are, if you're either on the cusp, if you're saying, hey, I need somehow to pay for this, um, or if you're just looking for maybe even a leg up later on in life, it's a cool opportunity. Um, so, again, you know, I, I, I took a second to plug med school coach as a side as like something that can really help you get in. We can up, we also help with the MCAT. So for those of you guys who haven't taken the MCAT yet, you probably know the MCAT is a really important factor in all of this. Um, we help with MCAT tutoring. We have MCAT uh, prep app, MCAT go our audio course. So a lot of really great products for you guys to, to utilize um, throughout your journey to make sure you actually end up getting in. And I'll speak um, to this as someone who's used med school coach during med school. Um, they offer tutoring for the step um, and level exams too. Uh, and, and for me, uh, for my step uh, level two exam, I uh, found a tutor from med school coach to be really helpful. That's how I originally kind of got plugged in with uh, with this program. So, so um, I'll speak to that as as someone who's used uh, your guys' services during med school. Um, 
Lots of these students here, I think, are, are about to get into that class, but still in the pre-med process. But I'll just vouch for that um, because uh, I think these services really go a long way. That's awesome. Thank you, Captain. Um, couldn't ask for a better, um, you know, endorsement than that. Um, I'll, I'll turn it back over to a few other questions. Um, you know, a couple of these, I think I know the answer to, but maybe I'll ask them anyway. There, there's a question from some of the high school students are if there's high school um, BSMD programs um, that are available, or is this available for high school BSMD students or only for uh, college students applying to medical school? Currently, only college students applying to med school, but there is some flexibility in that. So if there are specific questions about the timing of that. Um, I would recommend emailing myself or uh, Master Martin Johnson, Marlon Johnson, who's on here, and we can help get through the eaches of those questions because different things can be considered at different times. Oh, that's fantastic. I, di I didn't actually know that. I thought the answer was a flat out no. So that's 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 great. There's some administrative differences in them that we can work with. We just that's why I was like, it's hard to answer it in generalization. Sure. It, it, from the sounds of it, it sounds like the the army and the, the program is actually relatively flexible in the sense of they will try to make it work um, if you're committed to it. That's that's really fantastic. Um, let me see. There, there's a lot of other questions. Let me see if I can. Yeah, I think the, the other one um, might cater around sort of requirements to get the scholarship for the program. I think, you know, what I'd always e explain to students is if you get into a DO or an MD program, you're most likely eligible for the scholarship. Maybe you can shed a little more light on that or specifics as it relates to the requirements, GPA, MCAT score, if there are anything specific there. Yeah, there are specifics. I was just being subtle about it earlier because I don't want it to deter anyone from applying. So our minimum acceptance criteria is a GPA of 3.2 and an MCAT of 500. Sergeant Johnson, correct me if I'm wrong. Sometimes I blank on that. Um, but our automatic acceptance criteria is an MCAT of 507 or above and then a GPA of 3.6, 3.7. I can't remember exactly now in the moment. Um, so those are the kind of in-betweens. But even if you have an MCAT score less than that or a GPA less than that, but you have great research experience, great leadership experience, those are things that would make you stand out in a waiver process to potentially be selected as well. Thanks, Sergeant Johnson. I saw you confirm in the in the chat. I appreciate that. I always doubt myself with the numbers. <laughs> and I think that just clarified, there was a clarifying question about that applies to both MD and DO, and that's correct. There's not any difference in criteria for MCAT or uh, MD or DO students. Um, there, there's also questions around upper age limits um, for the program. So we have a, a fair bit of non-traditional students who maybe are going back and applying. Are, are there upper age limits? There's really not. So meet with a recruiter, they can they can get get through that. That's also something that can be waived. Um, and the Army is actually a great place for non-traditional students. And sometimes at an older point in life, you don't want to take on that student debt or you can't afford to not get a paycheck. Um, and so having tuition covered and getting some sort of monthly income, if you already have a fame and things, that's it's a great option um, for those non-traditional students to not take a huge financial hit on their journey of becoming a physician. That's fantastic. I definitely know um, several students in my own medical school class who who went through the program, and um, it it was you never as as you mentioned, Doctor Neumeyer, you never knew that they were in the program. It was not like it, it was nothing. Like they were they were just part of our med school class, um, but they. I think I don't want to say they had life easier, um, but, you know, in some ways they did. Right. It was like you didn't have to worry about your books. You didn't have to worry about tuition. You didn't have to worry about your meals. Um, it was inflow rather than outflow, which is which is pretty great at the end of the day as a as a student. So um, I think I, I again, I think it's a, it's a very reasonable um, pathway for for students who are for students who are out there. Um, I'll. 
you know, maybe ask um, a couple of more questions and feel, again, feel free to drop any questions. If we don't get to your questions, um, let us let us know, or we, we will know if we don't get to your questions and we'll try to get to them via email. You can always reach us um, at medschoolcoach.com. And I think um, a lot of the Army representatives have dropped their emails as well um, into the chat. Um, there, There is a question maybe for you, Major, on uh, family life. Uh, and I know you briefly touched on that, um, but I think there's a few people who are interested in understanding how how um, you balance family life, maybe with the Army, as well as your career as a physician. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I saw it come through the chat a few times, and it, it's something I'm super passionate about, so I could talk all night about it, and I don't want to <laughs> hijack it from being the focus on getting into med school. Uh, but I get asked that question as a female in the army all the time. Um, and I think the hardest part of family life for mom life for me is more the physician mom than the army mom piece of it. And that the weeks I'm on service in the intensive care unit, those are really busy weeks. Those are 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. and then on call overnight. So I don't get to drop my kids off at daycare. I don't get to do bedtime always. And so it's not really a balance. It's a shifting of priorities week to week. Because then the next week I'm not on service and I'm doing some of more of my teaching or my leadership duties. So I have a little more autonomy in my schedule. So I prioritize getting to do those things with my kids. Uh, so physician mom life is harder than army mom life for the most part. And I think that it's a balance of what you make it. Uh, but the army has great parental leave, not just for uh, the women having the baby, but they had a huge change in their, uh, I can't remember the exact name of the policy, but it's pregnant, uh, Pregnancy, postpartum, and family policy that changed, and it actually gives a ton of benefits for uh, paternal leave as well. So dads get to take some time off to be with their kids and support their families during that time. Uh, so there's been some huge changes within the Army that make it very family friendly uh, for, for everyone right now. That's fantastic. Um, Dr. Yu, any any parting thoughts on either the scholarship, med school coach, or your your life maybe as an intern? You're you're the closest to everybody else um, who's in this chat. Yeah, the um, scholarship was awesome. It really one uh, spoke helped me kind of just a lot of financial parts of school tuition. Um, and for many of you that are looking to osteopathic programs and may have seen the. Uh, the bill, it's, it's not cheap. And so that was a huge uh, financial relief taken care of. And then the monthly stipend really helped with food, living expenses, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and if you can prove that to um, required expenses, such as, you know, for example, board registration, um, for me, uh, buying an osteopathic uh, treatment table, um, as long as you can show in the syllabus that these are required by your school, um, I was able to get these paid for by HPSP as well. And so, uh, like you were saying, so it seems to your classmates, I was really able to focus on being a student. You know, the army is training us to be uh, to be a certain MOS physician, right? Whether that be a pediatrician, uh, in, in, internist, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so for the uh, years of school residency, you really are, you know, building towards the MOS. And so your focus is to be uh, trained towards that. And so... You know, from aside from the annual training to direct commission course, BOLC, and I think in recent years, Sergeant Johnson, they've melded the two courses in the same summer. I took it different summers. Um, really, aside the rest of the year, you really get to focus on your uh, craft of being a student. And that's one of the things I really appreciated. Yeah, okay, um, about the program. That's fantastic. Um, well, we're, we're coming up on the top of the hour here. Um, and so first, I, I wanted to really thank um, Captain New, Major Neumeyer, as well as everybody else um, who was on from the Army tonight um, to share their experience and, and this amazing program um, for all of you guys out there. I think it's really, again, it's just a, it's an incredible program for those of you who want to take advantage of it. Um, I really enjoyed just talking to you guys and learning a little bit more about the program myself. I've certainly um, interacted with a bunch of Army physicians over the years, and I've always been impressed by everybody who I've who I've come across. Um, and so I think, you know, if you guys are out there and applying to medical school, it's a great way to potentially think think through this. Um, I'd also, again, encourage you if you're applying to medical school, taking the MCAT, check out Med School Coach and our products, because it's really going to help you get in. And then the army can help you pay for everything and you know you're sort of set it's it's a great um 
it's a great win-win situation for everybody. Um, so for those of you guys who um, you know are still out there, if you go to medschoolcoach.com, you can contact us. Um, we have a bunch of um, links as well as the emails and cell phones um, of the Army representatives in the chat. So feel free to get in touch with them too with any questions. I know they're all happy to chat at any time. Um, and if there are questions along the journey, right? Um, you know, figuring out when to apply, how to apply, if you're if you're ready to apply, what whatever it is, um, you know, I think anybody uh, who's on this call tonight would be happy to answer some of those questions and, and mentor you along this process, which is so important to have great mentors along this process. So, um, again, you know, Major Katie Newmeyer, Captain Ezra, you thank you guys so much for joining us um, tonight, and thank you all um, who out there on the webinar for joining us, and looking forward to hopefully seeing more of you guys uh, in the near future, which is always great. Um, if you do enjoy these kind of webinars, you know, make sure to um, stay tuned and and um, be a part of the Med School Coach. Uh, journey and ecosystem. Oftentimes we're even doing live events. Uh, we've done it actually with the army a few times um, in different in different areas. We we went down to UT Austin a couple of week a couple of months ago and, and hosted a couple of events there and we see them all the time at different events. And so we're looking forward to even doing more events in the future uh, with them. So thank you guys again so much. Uh, I don't know if you guys have any other parting words. None for me. Just thank you so much for this opportunity um, to share our stories and just share what Army Medicine has to offer. We really appreciate it. Same here. Thanks, guys. All right. Well, thank you guys, every, uh, everybody, so much. Uh, it was great seeing everybody, and um, hopefully we'll see all of you guys out there soon. Take care.